Welcome everybody to today's webinar, Working with Complexity. My name is Michelle Robinson and I'm the Director of Evidence to Action at ANROSE. As we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners across Australia on which we meet today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Wherever we are today, we are on unceded land and, and I acknowledge and pay respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are participating in the webinar with us. Today's webinar is a panel discussion followed by a live question and answer session. So please send through questions at any time during the course of the discussion and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Today's webinar launches a suite of interconnected research on the Safe and Together Addressing Complexity, which is what the acronym STACY stands for, and also STACY for Children, which was published on the 13th of October. STACY for Children was developed in collaboration with the Queensland Department of Child Safety, Youth and Women and jointly funded by ANROSE and the Queensland Government. These projects led by Professor Cathy Humphreys investigated whether the Safe and Together model, when implemented holistically across services, leads to better outcomes for children and families living at the intersection of domestic and family violence and parental challenges of alcohol and other drugs and or mental health. So I'd like to introduce our panel. Everybody's full bio is available on the ANROSE website. So welcome Professor Cathy Humphreys from the University of Melbourne, Julianne Cork, the Regional Executive Director for the Morton Region, Department of Child Safety, Youth and Women in Queensland, Anne Tidyman, Manager, Child and Safety Services at Odyssey House in Victoria, and Lorna McNamara, who is the Director of Prevention and Response to Violence, Abuse and Neglect government in the Government Relations Branch in the New South Wales Ministry of Health. This is a confronting topic and some people may find it particularly distressing. It is really important to take care of yourself while you're participating in the webinar. If you would like to access support, there are some numbers up on the screen. So turning to you, Julianne, up in Queensland, where the sun might be shining finally after a weekend of torrential downpour. Can you tell us about what was happening in Queensland when the government co-commissioned the Stacey for Children research? Um, and then subsequently, how has the Queensland government implemented the evidence? Okay, thanks Michelle, and thank you for the acknowledgement to country. Um, look, Stacey was 2018 and Stacey for Children was 2019. There's a long history, I think, um, to Queensland's child safety services becoming um, domestic violence informed. But really around about that sort of 2014 and, and up to 16 time, we had significant reforms with the Carmody Inquiry and the Not Now, Not Ever um, task force and, and, and inquiry re response to domestic and family violence. It had become quite apparent um, domestic and family violence was a significant practice issue. And then the Patricia Project um, really confirmed that there were significant opportunities for improving our child protection practice as there were in other jurisdictions across Australia at that time. So that was about 2015-16. So around that time, um, and we'd been introduced to the Safe and Together model through our colleagues in um, domestic and family violence um, prevention. Um, we, we really embarked on a, a program of training our child protection frontline staff in the Safe and Together model. And similarly, a lot of our sector partners at that time too, so with a big focus on our family uh, support providers. Another initiative at that stage also that came out of the Not Now, Not Ever um, uh, task force, so Quentin Bryce, Dan Quentin Bryce's task force into domestic and family violence was a program called the Walking with Dads program, which principally used the Safe and Together model and embedded, a, a, in, in a sense, an expert practitioner into child safety service centres um, for across the state. Um, and that that practitioner had a focus on um, consulting and supporting staff with their domestic and family violence informed practice 
as well as um, focusing on engaging um, men and in particular fathers who, um, whose behaviour was responsible for harm to the children. That um, program was um, evaluated and it showed sort of significant success in increasing safety for children and their, and their mothers as well as holding fathers to account and giving them op an opportunity to sort of create I think a different set of outcomes for their for their children and families. Um, so by I suppose 2018 and 19 when we started to look at Stacy and Stacy for Children, we'd started to build some expertise, particularly in particular locations. So the key location really um, that has participated in a lot of this research has been Caboolture. So participated in, in previous uh, the previous study in visible practices. Um, and, and I guess we're really at a place where we're ready to take that next step around maturation, around not just seeing um, the causes of harm in their specific swim lanes, but really sort of engaging with and I guess um, seeking solutions to that sort of complexity that's associated with alcohol and drugs uh, and mental health and, and, and that connection um, with domestic and family violence. Um, it's probably also sort of Mentioning, you know, it also, and I, th I think this goes to the second part of the question around what we've done with with the evidence that emer has emerged from these studies. Really, um, the evidence base that comes from these studies has provided us with an ongoing sort of authorising environment, as well as, um, you know, sort of continued aspects of, of practice that we can develop and work with our staff on and embed into the systems that we have in our organisations. So we've done a lot of work that's been led by our official solicitor, embedding in our litigation model, DV informed practices and approaches, similarly our child protection training, um, practice materials and guides, embedding this sort of this, this approach um, and taking that forward. I think the promising information. So the Stacey for Children showed really promising signs about um, the potential for safe and together to lead for better outcomes to ch for children and their mothers and fathers. Um, but al also has provided us with other areas I think that we need to sort of look a bit more at, which is really how we, how we collect data, particularly around incidents and outcomes um, when we're using these models. So Thank you, Julia, and that's, that's been a great overview and, and presenting that background and the context in Queensland, but equally important is that focus on the authorising environment. Um, and I think this comes through very strongly in the research, um, equally the, the data collection, and we, we all know that that's such a, a critical mm. aspect of our work uh, in terms of reducing violence against women, but also, um, you know, one of the, probably the most difficult in terms of that consistency of data and, and then being able to, to apply it. Cathy, and you've managed to do some of that. So, um, Professor Cathy Humphreys, you've been working with Safe and Together model now for some time, um, as the, we, I think we're gonna put up a, um, a PowerPoint just to show the trajectory of, um, of the work that you've, that you've led. Can you explain how Stacey and Stacey for Children grew from the broader suite of research? And while one component of the project was specifically focused on changes in Queensland um, child protection system, can you explain how the findings are equally applicable to other states and territories? So thank you very much, Michelle. And yes, look, it's great to be here at this moment having the launch um, of two of the big programs of work and you know we've been terribly fortunate and I guess privileged to have this trajectory of a suite of programs that I guess has been part of um, funding from ANROS, part, part of funding from um, Department of Social Services but also huge amounts of funding and interest and in-kind work really from um, all the from all the different states involved and the practitioners involved. So, you know, there's been an impetus in this space. A lot of that's been created through the interest in a better informed practice where you've got domestic and family violence and where children are involved. Mm. So this work has rafted off 
um, a partnership that's been very exciting and fruitful, I think, for all of us with David Mandel and the Safe and Together Institute. It's been a wonderful um, program of work with him and his team where you bring research together with someone who's interested in developing the research, developing the practice and the resources. So it's a feminist informed model and it actually I think is designed particularly well for where we've got children involved where there's domestic violence and where we've tended to go off the rails a bit in terms mm. of often replicating the abuse rather than intervening in the abuse. So I think that that's just been a terrific opportunity. I'd like to acknowledge the fact that, you know, there's a lot of people on this webinar who've been involved in, in um, these projects and thanks to all of you. But also I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Lucy Healy, who is responsible for the project leadership for, for Stacey, Dr. Margaret Curtis for the project leadership for Stacey for Children, Dr. Arno Parolina for the amazing analysis of the Queensland Administrative Database, really worth a look in terms of the, um, the work with uh, Stacey for Children in that, in that report. And we'll talk about it a little bit more um, later in this event. And to Dr. Susan Hewitt-Bell for her leadership around the Stacey Practice Guidelines. So lots of work that's come out of this. The initial one, the Patricia Project, was all about how do you bring together child protection um, with domestic violence and family services. Um, the next one was going, if you're going to do that and if we're going to shift our practice, a lot of the Safe and Together model was you've got to pivot to the perpetrator. You've got to make men more visible because, you know, they are both part of the solution and part of the problem. And so then we had invisible practices, which was about working with men. And that led to then Stacey going, you know, we there's usually not just one um, one issue, domestic and family violence, it's often co-occurring either with mental health issues for mothers or fathers or um, AOD issues, alcohol and other drug issues for mothers or fathers um, alongside living with the domestic and family violence. And what we see in that space so often is as soon as the AOD issues or mental health issues emerge for women, then everything pivots to her and those problems and we lose sight of the domestic and family violence. So that's a sort of a key issue and a finding and the practice guides really developed out of that notion of how do we keep the perpetrator of violence in view when you've got issues of complexity. So I think that was a key issue that we wanted to engage with and where an outcome um, is uh, uh, involved with the practice guides. Also within the Stacey for Children, sorry, also within the Stacey project um, is a, a very important process evaluation of Genoe. And you know, Gen Genoe has been involved both with all these projects from inception but they've also had 20 years of work with very diverse communities, both called and Aboriginal communities, about how do you do all of family uh, approaches where you actually have, um, a pr have a service for men, a service for women, a service for children, and where you sometimes, when it's safe to do so, bring them together. You know, a very good example in that space and a very important example. I guess the other parts of the, um, a really important literature review that's available both in the report but also um, is open source um, with um, the journal Health and Social Care in the Community and that was led by um, Jasmine Esobi and I think is a very important piece of analysis about the literature in this space where you've got complexity. I'm thinking that I should leave it there, shouldn't I? And I'll be speaking further about the issues in relation to Aboriginal issues, in relation to the practice guides, in relation to um, Arno's work on the databases in Queensland. Great, thanks, Cathy. And I think it's really useful to have that overview um, in terms of the suite of projects. And of course, um, Janawi was very involved in the, um, the translation of both the Patricia research and also Invisible Practices 
Um, and before we do move on, Kathy, could you tell us about the Stacey practice guides and how they represent a practice development? Um, because there are two, and I think this is a critical point um, and who they're directed at. Okay, so <laughs> I can hear a sort of a collective sigh from the team when we had to develop two practice guides. So, you know, did we want to develop two practice guides? No, um, but we did a big state-based workshop with, you know, all the people that had participated in each state, for, um, with each state. And it was very clear when you brought together the program advisory group of senior managers with the practice leads of, who were involved in the communities of practice, that they wanted different things so that all the practice leads said, you've got to have something brief and sharp that practitioners can grab, take hold of, and gives them some guidance. And the senior managers said, no, we want a resource, you know, which actually tells you a little bit more than the briefer practice issues. Um, so we tried to negotiate. I know, well, in the Victorian one, we really tried to negotiate for just one guy. Anyway, that wasn't Abby. And so what we did was two resources, one which is a, a larger resource um, and practice guide. And I think it'd be really helpful for training and mm -hmm. to be able to develop and understand what's behind each of the kind of the bullet points. Whereas the summary practice guide is really much briefer and much more accessible for practitioners probably who are busy going out just thinking, what do I need to be reminded of? Yeah. So there are six different sections to the practice guides. One about partnering with women at the intersections. You know, what do you need to keep in mind when you're working across these areas for women? What do you need then? Second one was working with men at the intersections. You know, and that involves increasing the visibility of fathers who use violence and coercive control. Mm -hmm. And how, the, how, how AOD issues and mental health issues are used as part of the coercive tactics how you kind of bring that out, make it visible, name it, identify it. You can't work in this space without looking at worker safety. Working collaboratively is the only way to go. And I think that this is where the communities of practice are just wonderful venues for bringing different disciplines together, different organisations together to try and work you know, you've, if you're working with one family, they don't want you desperately working in opposition to each other. And these communities of practice are great venues for how you bring practitioners together to work with a shared vision and with a fair, shared way forward with a family. And I think that um, that was one of the key learnings out of this. And I guess influencing organisational practice change and capacity building. It was very clear, big messages, train last. You've got to not waste your money on just going out and training frontline practitioners and thinking they're going to be able to make changes. There's got to be the authorising environment provided, provided from within the organisation that ripples out and is part of top down, bottom up working together. And clearly, most importantly, focusing on children and young people at the intersections. We're dealing with adult services when you're dealing with adult, with overall, we're dealing with adult services when you've got mental health and, and AOD issues. How do they keep children in mind? So there's two things. One is how do they identify and assess for domestic and family violence as part of their standard practice? And the second thing is how do they identify um, their, their service users, the people that are coming to them for a service as parents? How do you ask about them as mothers and fathers and again those two things are often not done and create a huge step forward when they're done well and I know that Anne Tidyman's going to be talking about the journey that Odyssey House has been on um, which you know really has grappled with those two really big issues in important ways. Thanks Kathy that's a great overview. Um, the the practice guides are available also on the ANROS website. I just also like to acknowledge at this juncture that DSS commissioned the um, Stacey research um, directly, uh, recognising the critical importance of understanding 
those intersections um, and then the subsequent piece focusing on children um, was a, a um, an Anne Rose commissioned piece of research but all of it exists on the Anne Rose website and I think you can also get them through the University of Melbourne website um, as well and those links are interconnected for anybody like who'd like to, to access them. And I think it's a great segue to Anne um, and the, the way in which um, you were involved in the Stacey research, Anne. Um, just by way of background, what was the context in Victoria um, as you um, began that particip it began participation in the community of practice and the, and the Stacey research? Um, and then it'd be really great to understand how the findings were then implemented across Odyssey House and whether or not or how you would explain the start the, the, the changes in the way in which your staff have been responding. Yeah it was interesting in Victoria because we'd had the the two Royal Commissions so the Royal Commission into institutionalised child sexual abuse and we'd had the Royal Commission into family violence and from the Royal Commission into family violence um, I might say, start by saying Odyssey House, for those who don't know, is an AOD agency, so we work with alcohol and other drugs. The majority of our clients are adults. We do have family services, though. We have forensic care, youth services, hold services. We're across all of Metro Melbourne and all of regional Melbourne. And we actually have the largest residential rehab in Victoria. Um, that takes families, takes children. So we've been in the, the family space and the AOD space since about 1979. So that, going to the Victorian context with the two Royal Commissions, from the Royal Commission to Family Violence, we had MARIN, which is the Multi-Agency Risk Assessment and Management, and the introduction of the Information Sharing Scheme. And we were tranched to as an AOD service. So we have obligations under that to share and request information, but also to hold and manage risk under the intermediate assessment tool. Now, when Marin came out and we had these legal obligations, there was no assessment tool rolled out yet for us. And in fact, that's only been rolled out this year. Um, so we're grappling with how do we hold this space? How do we hold the complexity? How do we keep a perpetrator visible? Um, within a small program I run Kids in Focus, we've been sort of trying to do that oh, because we worked with whole of family. But this was whole of agency shit. And we became part of Stacey. And we chose the, the, the two workers who went to the communities of practice really carefully. They were workers who held positions where they did clinical reviews, uh, they worked out treatment plans with clinicians, and they did clinical supervision. But also they were really well respected, like they were held in high esteem, I suppose I'd say. They went to the communities of practice. I can't hear what you're saying, Kathy, you're on mute. <laughs> and they're fantastic. <laughs> um, and I sat on the plan. And they were terrific. Oh, amazing women. They, Seriously. They, and they really contributed. Yeah. Um, and then as part of Stacey, we got three days training in Safe and Together. And that first day, that was the moment the three of us sat there going, oh my God, this is this is it. This is what allows us to pivot our practice across all of agency to hold that space the family violence lens still do the AOD work and keep children safe it was uh, it, I, I, I still get goosebumps about that first day and we seriously we've been on a journey at Odyssey ever since <laughs> now it's one thing to get all your clinicians trained in online training yeah, that's fine. Everyone can go off and do training. That doesn't make it sustainable practice and that doesn't make it practice change. So there's been a whole raft of things that we've done at Odyssey. Um, in response to being a child safe organisation, we set up child safety officers across the agency that would 
be used for secondary consults when children were involved in very complex families. When we introduce Safe and Together, we're, we're actually shifting those now towards family safety clinical leads. And they will all do the four day core training of Safe and Together and Safe and Together supervision training. Um, the other thing we did at Odyssey to embed this practice um, was to set up a monthly communities of practice, all Odyssey communities of practice, where each of our teams pre present a case they've worked with that has involved family violence and of course alcohol or other drugs. And we tie that to the, the principles of MAM using the Safe and Together model. So we're aligning with our obligations under Marum. And some of us have been trained in leading alignment, uh, the comprehensive or the intermediate Marum assessment tool. So there's all this external stuff that we as an agency, which is an NGO, um, has to respond to. And the best client outcomes, and that very first moment of, of training in Safe and Together, Sona, Taryn and I sat there going, oh my God, this is it. This is the practice model that aligns to a risk assessment and allows an adult AOD agency to hold that space for children. Um, but it's like I said before, it's not just about sending people to training. It's how you keep the momentum going, how you embed it, You've got staff who come and go, so you need staff there that holds this knowledge that keeps it going. And in fact, because um, in Victoria we have enhanced pathways, so we uh, applied for a submission. Um, we got the money to, the, well, the funding to allow us to roll out this training to keep it going. And we're actually sending some people to train the trainer, which starts next week. So again, we'll be able to just have this ongoing. And I think where the, David has said, we're the first adult AOG agency that has partnered with Safe and Together. So, and we'll be doing some research around that. But it's, it's, you, you know, we picked our first champions very, very well, clinicians who we thought would get this, and you'd walk through the office and you could hear them talking and unpacking and leaning into the non-offending parent. You could hear them picking up red flags. Now, these are clinicians who probably hadn't done NARAM training yet in the intermediate assessment that we have to use in Victoria. Um, they've already got there. Because, and, and the other really, really important thing about this is the language, the shared language. They can't, it takes away that, that paradigm of mother not acting protectively. It really takes, it shifts that whole thing and the documentation that goes along with this practice model, absolutely invaluable. Um, I kind of think, that's it for me for the moment. I'm not sure how I went. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you. That was a, a really good description of both the Victorian context, but also the way in which Odyssey House has engaged in the research. And in terms of embedding it, I, I would, could you want to just um, very quickly articulate how that's happening? Like how, how is the the sustaining it's going. Really and one of the things we realised early on, and we, I mean, Odyssey is an amazing organisation because what we've had is the executive and the board supporting this, and then we've had staff supporting it as well. And we have a core group, which I'm part of. And when we, so, um, the last communities of practice within Odyssey, which is open to all Odyssey staff, and it's a, an expectation if they can't attend on the day, it's recorded and they access it as further PD and training. Mm -hmm. So meet with the team that's going to present, 
we ask them about the case, we talk about the case, uh, we pull in where it aligns with Marum, if they've used information sharing, what have they done with that? And then we talk about how they've aligned with, or with the non-offending parent or where they've held the perpetrator visible and looked at the impact on the child's well-being and family functioning. Like, what does that look like? We've um, looked at alcohol and other drugs as a form of coercive control. I mean, is someone bringing drugs into the house or are they interfering with someone's um, ability to access services? So you, I'm not sure people, I'm not sure the AOD field actually unpacked it that much. They, they look just at the AOD and some of the family stuff sitting there. This is very broad strokes, by the way, because there's yeah. clinicians that always did that. Um, but this has meant, and you feel it and hear it, and when you sit in clinical reviews, it is, nothing gets left out anymore. It is a whole family approach. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy, did you I just say one more thing too, Anne, that in terms of taking this work forward, you know, there's another project going where um, yes. Odyssey House has really embraced this thinking around well, how do how does AOD intersect with domestic and family violence and what could we do positively? And you've developed a collaboration with Kids First, yes. you know, around <laughs> which hope, you know, where we're doing some setting up the evaluation for that, which brings together and will joint, there'll be joint facilitation between a program for fathers who use violence with men who are coming through um, Odyssey House. So it's a wonderful potential innovation and collaboration. So what it's looking at, and it's the Cody project, if I can, it's looking at, when men go to a, um, I'm going to call it a men's behaviour change, but it's not classified as a men's behaviour change, uh, course. So if you do group work for 17 weeks, is that enough to shift patterns of behaviour that have probably been ongoing for so long? What happens if you wrap around a specific AOD service that then works with all of them? and continues that work after the group ends. And we're going to be looking at that, which I, it's just amazing, we're exciting. <laughs> so it's, it, this project has taken us in such a direction and it's really allowed the whole agency to pivot towards, we had child safety, mm -hmm. but we've just pivoted and made it wider and we're actually really working at that intersection now of family violence, AOD and mental health. Great. Thank you for that further um, explanation and great segue to you Lorna. As, thank you for waiting patiently. Um, as the Director for Prevention and Response to Violence, Abuse and Neglect in the Ministry for Health in New South Wales, what was the policy context in which the, the New South Wales jurisdiction participated in the Stacey research. Um, and, and, what you, and how are those findings being implemented across the state? Uh, thanks, Michelle. And I agree with Cathy. It's very exciting to be here and really innovative, exciting work to be involved with. I just thought I'd explain that um, violence, abuse and neglect in the New South Wales context mm -hmm. means for New South Wales Health, I have strategic and policy responsibility for sexual assault, domestic and family violence, child physical abuse and neglect, and children and young people with problematic or harmful sexual behaviours. And the policy context I'm referring to, I'll just talk to four major pieces. The first was the New South Wales Domestic Family Violence Blueprint for Reform. Um, and that is managed by um, Women New South Wales. They coordinate across government. 
And that was a really important initiative. It, of course, talked about prevention, early intervention, services for victims, but it brought in a whole dimension around accountability of perpetrators. And that really required government and New South Wales Health to relook at our policy settings and make changings to take account of that. The other um, really important piece was the Premier's priorities. She has um, many, but two that are really significant in this are keeping children safe and reducing domestic family violence reoffending. Thirdly is the Domestic Violence Death Review Team and their recommendations. And I sit on the DVDRT and they had consistently um, presented reports talking about the intersections between domestic family violence, uh, mental health and alcohol and other drugs. And I'm sure every one of our, our people on this panel are aware of the significance of those issues. And then I suppose from a New South Wales health context, we had just developed what's called the Integrated Prevention and Response to Violence, uh, Abuse and Neglect Framework. And that was trying to highlight the issues of violence, abuse and neglect. We did a really important piece of work looking at the co-occurrence of violences. So if you're a sexual assault service, you will oftentimes be also working with a woman who is experiencing domestic family violence. If you're working in domestic family violence, you are often also working with child abuse and or sexual assault, either adult or child. And we felt the service system needed to change to be able to actually work with clients and the complexity of their presentations. And so we looked at integrating across our sector, but also into New South Wales Health and with our partner agencies. Now I've been watching the work of Cathy for many, many years and one of her colleagues, Dr. Leslie Lang. And so when Leslie and her colleague, Dr. Susan Hewitt-Bell approached us about participating in SAFE and Together, um, we were really excited within the Ministry of Health because it's one of those programs that has absolute rigour. Um, they back it up, they've done a lot of work. You know, Dave Mandel has been in this area for a long time and is talking about the fact that we need as systems to take responsibility. We can't keep putting it back on individuals. So we we're really excited to participate and so uh, Susan led that piece of work in New South Wales and we chose two local health districts. And in that we brought in our uh, child protection counselling services and our whole of family teams in two districts. And our whole of family teams are uh, mental health and alcohol and other drug. They work together to work with parents where there are child protection concerns around mitigating issues around um, alcohol use and drug use. Um, and you know mental health issues along with child protection and that was a really such a successful program there are still ongoing uh, positive outcomes from that piece of work and Susan wrote the guidelines from uh, that project now we want this to become sustainable health is a massive organization we've got around 130,000 staff um, uh, I, my own background is mental health and alcohol and other drug. In adult services, we tend to work with the client that comes through the door. And I really wanted to acknowledge the workforce there. They do a great job, they really do. Um, and they advocate for their client group, but it tends not to be family focused, I think. Mm -hmm. When we're working in this area, really we have to begin looking at families. And so um, I think that as we begin this work, uh, what I'm hoping and what I am seeing from the outcomes of the Stacey project is that our uh, mental health and alcohol and other drug workers in collaboration with our child protection, our van workforce, will begin mm. to see that whole of family and also that they have a shared language. Up to now, we tended to work really in silos. That is what we're trying to shift. And what I think Stacey is so, so eminently skilled to do is starting to shift those silos to where we have a shared language, a shared understanding of the complexity of the dynamics we, we're working with um, and how we can, as Anne was saying, how we can intervene in that at the mm. practice level. It is critical that we get to that level of detail. 
And so um, we are now moving on to the ESTE project with Kathy and her team. The names are terrific, aren't they? This is called the, <laughs> the Evidence to Support Safe and Together Implementation and Evaluation Project. That's for the next two years. Mm -hmm. And we've gone to our districts to ask them to put in an expression of interest because as uh, uh, Julianne mentioned, and certainly as Anne has mentioned, we do need an authorising environment. Mm -hmm. As we know, we need commitment from our senior executives, not just in the van space, but in the mental health and alcohol and other drug space, um, to come together and to support the clinicians as they go forward on this project. Uh, so that's our next piece of work. We've just started that, and uh, that should go live sometime in February next year. Um, yes, yeah, so that's that's my piece. Right, we'll be looking forward to that. Thanks so much, uh, Lorna. And I think what you've you've really sort of brought together very nicely um, is that shared language, that the systems approach, and the importance of an authorising environment and a shared language that supports that. And we've moved from looking at you know just within the domestic and family violence specialist sector and and child protection. Um, sector to now including um, drug and alcohol and, and the mental health sectors as well as um, as part of that response, which um, is yeah, all of it, three different jurisdictions have just really clearly articulated how they've been applying um, the findings from your research, Cathy. And I think one of the other issues that I wanted to talk about was the, the, um, the data issue, which was flagged early on. And Cathy, you've analysed the child protection administrative databases in Queensland as, as part of Stacey for Children. Can you tell us about this part of the study and how other states and territories um, might be able to rely on the findings and whether or not it creates any sort of authorising environments for them in, in these findings to better enable the analysis of outcomes um, for implementing practice change? Okay, I think it's a bit of a stretch to say that I led the database research, can I just say. <laughs> it was really um, Dr Arno Parolini who did that work. And I think what comes through really clearly if you read the report is it's very specialised work. Um, he loves that work. And he and the, and the data analysts at Queensland, in Queensland um, really worked with such a wonderful partnership. So, you know, just full testimony to um, the Queensland um, Department and the way in which they shared the aggregated data. You know, it wasn't, it was de-identified. Um, mm. But such a nice um, partnership with Arno really pushing things along about this is how you can use your database. Because I guess the question, you know, for the politicians is always, what well, does it make a difference? And particularly on the key parameters that we want to see it making a difference on. Now. Mm. Um, when we set up Stacey with Children, we were going, you know, and, and Julianne was really part of this with her senior colleagues going, well, we need the narratives of what, um, you know, what clients say, you know, what people who are um, service users in this space are saying, so, so mm -hmm. that we have some stories to fit with what's going on in the database. So we did interviews with 21 um, people who had been experienced the um being uh who'd, who'd had who were working with practitioners who'd been trained in safe and together asking them not about safe and together but how was this practice you know what was it like working with this and so in the stories you could see that there was a shift they were saying this is different from what it was before there's quite a lot of evidence around that but then the database work was really done with Arno. And, you know, there were two major things that he did in when they worked together to work out, well, what do we need to do um, to, to make the most of this piece of work? So the first thing they did um, was to look at the rate at which practitioners made plans for interventions with parental agreement during, during intake and assessment. So he looked at that because one of the things that Safe and Together is supposed to do is a better partnership. You know, and it's not sort of, um, it's not looking down and over. 
you know, it's not power on, but trying to do power with, which mm -hmm. should show in the voluntary agreement. Now, what showed was, in fact, that there was a great increase in plans that were identified, but the statistical analysis was not able to confirm that those changes were directly accountable mm -hmm. and relate to um, Safe and Together. Like there's clearly a trend there that was very clear, but to some extent it does say, if you're going to do this work, you've really got to be clear about what are the parameters in your database that you're looking mm -hmm. for and how that data goes in and is collected. The, so the second relationship was also about the looking at the introduction of the Safe and Together model and out of home care placements for children in need of protection, protection to have a look at what the implications might have been there and whether they showed up in the database and particularly where you had an area that had been working closely um, as almost like a centre for excellence around mm -hmm. safe and mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. Now, again, what it showed was there was clearly, um, there has been a real trend towards um, fewer children coming into care. So that was exciting. We all got excited about that. And then Anna goes, be careful. When he compared with everywhere else, it was hard to do and to make the case. And again, it raises issues. And this was really a pilot about how can you use the administrative data in this space to really look at whether you're having an impact on practice. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think what it highlighted was, yes, there are trends that are positive, but it also said that there are things that you would need to set up earlier on to really look at how you might um, do more sophisticated work around the analysis of the databases in relation to particular areas where which are involved in new practices. Thank you. It is a, a recurring issue, isn't it? Measuring impact. Um, but I think, Cathy, you pointed out the importance of thinking about capturing data so that you can actually measure the change, even if it's a trend um, in terms of um, children and domestic and family violence from the outset. Just turning very briefly to, I think we'll start with you, Lorna. Can you tell us how this has influenced your plans for implementation or practice change? What, do you, what, what data are you looking at? Oh, that's a really great question and, and data is significant. Part of the project that we've, um, the ST project with Cathy is that we have asked that focus on documentation. Uh, we've got a number of issues. One is collection of data and the type of data that's collected. But the other issue is the quality of the data, what's being recorded. And what we have found and what we think is really critical in this area is that we are not doing our client group justice if we haven't collected the right type of data, both in you know how uh, the non-offended family member, usually the woman, is what she's doing to try and protect her child, but also if we're working um, with the uh, perpetrator of violence, the, the sorts of behaviours that are um, increasing risk and lack of safety their partner and children and that is a really big piece of work so we're asking Cathy to actually focus on documentation and separate to that we have established our own internal documentation group to start looking at policy and how we can support and improve um, guidance for our clinicians around that area. Mm. That sounds like some yeah some great steps in the right direction and Juliana are you taking the work that um, Kathy is doing further. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Definitely, okay. in terms of applying some of those findings around, I guess, the limitations of our administrative data, we've got coincidentally two really great opportunities. So, one has been the formation of our new Chief Practitioner's Office. And certainly part of the role of that office is to improve, I suppose, our framework for measuring our performance and outcomes. So bringing, you know, quality and outcomes and, and performance together. As well as that, we've got a really um, big redevelopment of our um, client management system underway currently. So again, 
this provides a good opportunity for us to take some of the learnings that came out of um, Stacey for Children into the development of that new sort of um, data collection, the, the elements of that system that are data collection and reporting. Thank you. And I think both of those um, exist as, you know, potential, um, I guess, templates or uh, ways in which um, other jurisdictions can look at the, I mean, it's, it's something that is difficult for all jurisdictions. Um, and just unpacking yeah. some of the ways that you're, you are responding to the, the, um, the issue is really helpful. Now we've actually, we've come to the end of our formal presentation session um, and we have a few questions. Um, Cathy, I'm going to start with you and these have come in from the audience while we've been discussing um, Stacey and Stacey for children. And I think this is a, a particularly pertinent one. The, okay, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children are, as we all know, overrepresented in the child protection system. Your research recommends that better um, outcomes for these children require a separate study. How would you respond to this? Look, I think that across this suite of, um, of um, studies that we've done, I've been very concerned that often you know we have practitioners or um, service users who um, are part of the project um, and you know sometimes creating creating great leadership and you know you've got to take your hat off to Jackie Ruck in Queensland who's just such mm -hmm. a wonderful um, Aboriginal leader in this space um, but overall I think there's um, there needs to be a project that really takes forward what do um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, people, you know, families and communities want in this space where you've got the intersection of domestic and family violence with alcohol, drugs and mental health. And I think that that requires it to be an Aboriginal led project um, because it's a terribly sensitive area. and it's not an area that can be led from, you know, um, it's got to be led by Aboriginal organisations and Aboriginal researchers, you know. And so I think that Anne Rose, I know, is looking at that space along the way and has commissioned some work in that area, though not necessarily around safe and together, or not necessarily around complexity. Mm -hmm. I think that's still a project um, that needs to, you know, that's that's got to have it today and is, you know, I think ready to happening because you see, particularly in the Aboriginal area, you do have much more holistic practices that mm. are desired, that are named, that are identified and have always been, they've said right from the get go, we don't want a fragmented response. Mm. And so really these models that we're working with in a domestic violence space are about trying to have a more holistic practice, but they do need to be accurate. Yeah. We are, thank you. I'm going to keep going. Um, one of the, the questions, and I think you've all touched on this briefly, but it'd be interesting to see what um, the, um, both Lorna or Lorna Julian and Anne might respond. How do you build and sustain collaborative child focused practice at the interaction of health and other services? And Anne, you've touched on this um, as well, but I guess it's just a, a really succinct summary from the three of you in terms of your policy and practice expertise. We'll lead with you, Lorna. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to quickly say, I think community of practice model has been an incredibly important and an amazing um, way to move forward collaborative practice and obviously if you're using the safe and together model children and their safety and well-being and their mother's well-being is at the center of the practice so obviously having a good clear common framework i.e safe and together communities of practice um, excellent sort of mechanisms as well as those usual governance mechanisms that bring together the key stakeholders. 
seem, seem to work really well for us and, and, and achieve that outcome. That's the person who's asked the question. It's obviously keen to understand. Thanks, Julianne. And look, I'd agree with Julianne, um, Michelle. I think I think the model itself really has the rigor that we're looking at. And uh, but what we're doing to help support that is we're um, locking some of this into the policy context that we're developing. We've got a domestic family violence um, strategy that's going through the process of sign off, and part, some of those actions are building of communities of practice in an ongoing format. We've also looked at funding the Education Centre Against Violence, which is part of New South Wales Health um, here, of course, so that they become really undertake a lot of the training with David Mendel and the Safe and Together Institute so we can build in sustainability. And at, in that space at ECAV, we do see mental health, alcohol and other drug and domestic violence, child abuse, etc., all coming together in to resolve some of those issues. I also just wanted to come back to what Cathy was saying around, you know, working with Aboriginal uh, communities mm. and families and just to also, um, you know, reinforce what she was saying. We've been working with the Aboriginal Family Wellbeing and Violence Prevention Network here in New South Wales for many, many, many years. And they have always managed all of these issues together. Yes their men and women, looking at how they can solve that. And a lot of our learnings have been from those communities. I think we have really benefited from their commitment to keep working in a family model and how important that is. And I and that's what we where we've got to go. We've got to start looking at families. You know, it is important that we identify and advocate for individuals, but we've got to look at that within the context of family. So we're doing the best for our children, our young people, um, and for non-offending family members. Yep, that all the family, or whole the family. Thanks, Anne. Yes, sorry, I agree with all of that. The communities of practice, um, the cross-sector collaboration, but the the key, and you touched on this, Lorna, the shared language. It's so important um, to to get it to, to not miss anything, to not miss child safety, to not miss pulling out strength from an honest offending parent, and to keep perpetrators visible and in view, even if you if you're not working with them per se, if they've disappeared or you know they're not anywhere in sight, still hold them accountable the same way we hold women accountable. I think as or mothers accountable is, is hugely important. Um, and communities of practice and sustainability. And yeah, we have a lot to learn from the way Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities work with this space. That's from me. Yeah. Thank you. I think that has summed that up really, really nicely. Um, one other question we've had, which we haven't touched on, were police and courts included in Stacey? Who'd like to lead? Julianne. Oh, Kathy, would you and then Julianne? No, it's a segue to Julianne because, in fact, that's where it happened. Okay. Mm. Oh, look, police, police for us were really big leaders in this. Um, so they were have been involved all the way along. Um, so definitely in Stacey. And look, um, courts to a certain extent. So so yes, but they, they were, um, they, they sort of were a group we were bringing in in later, but corrections were also a big um, part, party to the um, communities of practice and continue to be. Thank you. Lorna or Anne, did you have anything else to add to that? We, we haven't in the Stacey project or the SD per se. I suppose mm. I would say that we're trying to get our own house in order. So we're trying to build some of the expertise for our workforce, but we collaborate very closely with uh, police and with um, Department of Communities and Justice. They're really important. Women New South Wales has a coordinating role. So much of what we do will feed back into the, those kind of interagency meetings and what some of those outcomes are, but definitely something for us to consider into the future. Mm -hmm. And was police part of your 
I think in Victoria, just to, as not so much as part of Stacey, but Stacey and Safe and Together come into it, we have area-based implementation committees, and that's around cross-sector co collaboration, and that's an authorising environment um, that's chaired by DHHS here in Victoria. Mm. And Vic Pohl sit at, at um, the A, as does all mental health, AOD and family violence services. Mm. And they um, uh, give the authorising environment for the specialist advisors to do the capacity building across the catchments. So there yeah. is work being done in that space that we are a part of. Mm. Mm. So it again comes comes back to that that systems approach and and including all of the the critical actors, but also focusing on the whole of family as that's happening. Yep. There are so many more questions that we're just not going to have an opportunity to respond to. So I think we're going to end it here. Um, I'd like to thank you all so much um, for giving up your time. You're all incredibly busy people. Um, and even more so in, in states where you've just come out of lockdown um, and in states where you're dealing with, you know, extreme weather events um, and we're all experiencing something very different. So thank you very much. Um, and it's great to have everybody, um, you know, to be able to participate in a, um, in a situation where we can't meet to do this face to face anymore. So thank you. Um, and I commend um, all of all of you on engaging in the process and Kathy for you for leading it. Thanks, Julianne. Thank Thanks, you. Lorna. Thanks, Anne. Um, thank and the, as I said earlier. Say thank you to Anne Rose. I'd just like to say thank you to Anne Rose and the team behind you, Michelle, for putting this webinar together. You know, it's just such an opportunity for us. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. No, it's, it's great to be able to, under, to unpack it and to, and to meet the people that are engaged in the process, um, both from a policy and a practice perspective. So um, for everybody who's watching, um, we'll wrap up. But in, importantly, just remember that the research reports and the, the, the practice guides will be there, um, all of them, on the ANROS website and the University of Melbourne website. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. I'm Michelle Robinson, and on behalf of ANROS, I say goodbye. Bye.